Hello, everyone. Um, I'm glad you're here for this uh, presentation on how to find your uh, ancestor, your Mexican ancestors in South Texas and Mexico. I think it's extremely exciting work. I've um, been doing it for um, since 2008, and it just gets more and more interesting. So um, I hope that I can convey some of that um, really interesting complex, um, uh, the complexity of it to you. Um, so, um, and this is our, our third and final presentation in the Museo del West Side series that we've been having. Um, in May, um, in, in um, March, I started with one about how to care for your family materials. And then in April, Laura Hernandez Arisman did one on conducting oral histories with your family members. And then this is our, our final one on, on how to then once you've maybe worked on the current for a while, then how to go backwards from that and figure out who your family is, was, and could be. <laughs> could be is important because sometimes we can't be real certain about some of the records, So, but we try. So, uh, and this is National Preservation Month, so uh, in May. And so this is also, you know, a really nice effort toward honoring that month. Um, and all of these, the past two presentations and this one will be available on the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center's YouTube channel. And at some point, I'm sure Natalie can put that link into uh, the Facebook comments and the YouTube chat. So, but first I wanna uh, take a moment to really acknowledge, uh, recognize and congratulate Natalie Rodriguez, um, who is ever present behind the scenes uh, in, in you know, making these presentations happen. She's graduated uh, just this past month from her master's degree program. And so that's no small feat. And she worked hard at it and while working part-time at the Esperanza, uh, doing fundraising and various promotional things. So in the comments, please give some love and congratulations to Natalie. Okay, just wanna mention that. Um, so again, my name is Donna Guerra and I participate with the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center in a variety of projects that have to do with the Museo del West Side and also with building and making accessible the archives that they have as part of their organization. So um, I have been seriously doing computer-based genealogy since about 2008. Um, and so I say computer-based because I haven't actually gone out and you know, uh, found records from my family members and, and talked to them about places, dates, names, things like that. I owe a great debt of gratitude to my younger brother who started doing that kind of work, old school in-person family history work uh, in the 1980s. And so a lot of our families from you know, the Kennedy, Texas area and, he, and we have relatives here and he would go to them and, and just, I've got extensive notes that he's made and those have been absolutely essential uh, to checking the documents that I find against the notes that he took down from living people. So um, I'm, I'm really grateful for that work. And also my younger sister, Claudia, she went through some photo albums and she, with my mother at some time, I think in the 1990s, and wrote identified people and names in those albums. So I also use that to confirm against documents that I find online to, to, to try to make sure that those are the right people. So I'm really indebted to those two family members in particular and my other family members who have shared you know, stories with me uh, about who they, you know, what they think the names were and where they were told they lived and, and things like that. So it's truly been uh, a family endeavor uh, over the years. Um, so, uh, Historical research um, supported by genealogy work is one way that we really can recover our uh, Texas Mexican history, um, which is largely, as we are probably aware, has been absent from the official authorized uh, textbooks, history textbooks, um, and uh, national, state, and local histories, 
and monuments and museums and archives and landmarks. So uh, we, we can contribute to recovering the history of a people in a place uh, with information about our ancestors that we find doing genealogy work. Um, records like census, US census records, uh, birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates, city directory entries, wills um, and deeds uh, that pertain to the land and um, different stories. These are the different types of records that provide location, family member names, data, and can't forget clues because sometimes there's information that we can't quite make sense of, but we, we really should treat it as a clue and, and put our investigative cap on and think you know, what that might relate to or, or you know, what, what it could mean. So um, just about this presentation again, we'll have about um, eight minutes um, about as starting at uh, 11.30 uh, for a little Q&A. Uh, Natalie's going to tell me what some of the questions, um, if there are any, uh, some of what some of the questions are that have been put in the Facebook comments and the YouTube chat. And, um, and then I'll see what I can answer in eight minutes. Then I wanna continue on with the rest of the, the presentation. And I will stop about 12, 10-ish, uh, 10 after 12. And then we will have the remaining part uh, until 12.30 for more Q&A. And I, I really do hope you have some good questions and answers. Again, this, the emphasis here in this presentation is beginners. So, um, hopefully not to get too far afield in your questions as well. Keep them sort of at a beginner rate and think about what might benefit the others in this presentation who are absolute beginners, you know, so, so they can actually make use of the information. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen now, one moment. Okay, um, so this is the title of what we're doing today. Okay. Okay, let's see. Okay. And this is a little more about this presentation, what we're going to focus on, a little bit of reflection about why we want to find our ancestors and what we might hope to gain. Um, we're going to, I, I asked on the Facebook page, and I hope some of you have been able to do it. I shared different generational charts um, to try to get the names, places, um, birth dates, marriage dates, death dates, uh, for at least three generations back. And that gives you a really good starting point for which to begin a, a really good genealogy uh, research. And then um, I also asked uh, in those Facebook sharings, and I apologize to those of you who are on Facebook, we can get those um, documents to you later, uh, to register on familysearch.org and ancestry.com. Uh, as a guest registered free account, not a trial account, but a, a guest registered free account where you can explore records. You won't have the full database as if you had a paid subscription, but you can find out a lot of things and then go to Family Search and see if the records there. Family Search is completely free. Uh, but in order to see the images of all these fantastic number of records, you do have to have a free registration. Um, we're going to practice a little bit of looking at the Spanish that occurs as it occurs in different Mexican records, meaning, meaning records found in Mexico collections, you know, so they're in Spanish and some are typed and some are handwritten. So, and, and maybe keywords in them that are helpful to know about to translate them, then talking more about those specific terms and abbreviations used in particular in Mexican church records, and I'll talk more about that later. And then through all of this, I think we'll become aware of how to work with the challenges that inevitably come up doing uh, Spanish language research and Mex Mexican colonial record research and US record research, particularly in the census. So another thing I wanna uh, address real quickly is, you know, there, there are ways that we can approach um, genealogy as a reflective uh, practice and process and talk about things, say, um, from 
pose kind of feminist oriented questions or intersectional oriented questions and really bring it into a kind of modern critical understanding uh, of what we're looking at. For instance, I, I just ask a few questions here. Are you excited to find indigenous or Afro-Mexican or Spanish or other European family members? Is one of these more preferable to you than another, to a, more preferable than another? Sorry for the two. And um, so that's like to get at, because I, I, I I participate in a lot of boards and, and so many people are so determined to find their connection to royalty, which is fine. If that's a fact, that's great. But sometimes I think, you know, wouldn't you find an indigenous relationship really exciting? And if you don't, why not? So these are just some sort of questions you might quiz yourself about. Um, and then why can it be so difficult to find records about your female ancestors? And on Facebook, somebody did respond uh, because women take the, the, the male surname. So um, that can certainly be an issue, particularly in the United States uh, and also in Mexico and more modern Mexican records. But in colonial records, you know, the woman keeps her, her has her, they have the two surname system where the male surname is there, but also her maternal, she keeps her maternal name at the end. So um, these are all different, potential different reasons and, and there are more of why that might be difficult. And you wanna ask maybe who was controlling the production of the records in the US and Mexico and what effect might that have on finding your ancestors? Another question, what kind of migration did your ancestors experience either to the United States or when they got to Mexico, if they migrated, if they weren't already there? Was it a forced or voluntary migration or was it a mixture over time? And how does that affect you know, the records that you're looking for? And um, also what kinds of questions about the records that I find open up a space for aspects of family histories that have been silenced, erased and suppressed? So those are some things that you can think about later. For instance, um, some of us may have heard about the woman called Malinche. Um, she was, she's described in many different ways. She's very controversial. Um, two Mexicans and two Americans and two Mexican-Americans and Chicanos, everyone. Some people call her a traitor. Some people call her a survivor. Some people call her an interpreter. Some people call her a consort. She might be any one of these things. Um, but some people have tried to do the genealogy for her, which I find extremely exciting. This is just one example. And she had multiple partners. Um, I don't know if they were all in marriage, but here they're calling her Malinali Tenepatl. And this is the, the um, genealogy to one of her marriages to a man named Juan Jaramillo. And so, um, and of course, in, in older colonial uh, Spanish spellings. The ha, the jota the, for jaramillo is spelled with an x, an x. So those are things you'll need to start thinking about too when you start searching for Mexican colonial mm -hmm. records, like how might they have spelled it? You try different spellings, right? So anyway, this is one attempted um, genealogy of her. Here's another one that um, is focused on her son with Cortez named Martin Cortez because she was also, of course, we know, um, uh, a partner to Cortes. And so then it gives different um, descendancy, different people that descended from um, that union and then half siblings and whatnot. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, but I think this is really exciting. So I would love to find my connection to, um, you know, a more ancient native women, if that could be at all possible. So as Mother's Day is with us, and so I wanna give a lot of gratitude to our indigenous and African mothers. And these are some links that you can check out later. Uh, different women named Doña Isabel Moctezuma. She was Moctezuma's daughter, and there have been some interesting genealogies done of her. Uh, there's a, just a general list of indigenous Mexican women and an article about the Africans of Mexico and, um, and a certain census and how these things play out. So I invite you to look at those later. So remember when we do our own genealogy, we, we, we start from ourselves, right? Our own data, where we were born, you know, where we're our different uh, life, vital 
you know, milestones. And then we go back to our parents. I also shared this chart with uh, many people and uh, it starts, you can see you are here. And uh, then with a little bit of descendancy, if I had a child or a grandchild, but then mostly going ancestor, the direction of ancestors and, and some living, of course, if there's a, a sibling with children. So you can see that going backward. I, I have to refer to this a lot. I, I, I frankly, I get confused a lot. So um, I love having charts like this to sort of make sure I, I know which degree of relation I'm talking about. So the kinds of US records that are useful to Mexican genealogy um, are census, US census records. Um, they start in the mid 1800s. Um, many are uh, available in the databases that I've told you about family search and ancestry. And they go up to 1940. Um, they always have them available up to certain years because of what they are considering privacy concerns and legal concerns. But 1950 will be available in April 2022. So those of us who do genealogy are anxiously awaiting the arrival of that set of records. And, um, and then immigration records. Um, I'll give you a link that you can look at you know, later when this presentation is available. And um, these are border crossings a lot and alien recording as they call it. You know, you get an alien number, registration number, and then a naturalization papers. So uh, that's the variety of, uh, of US records that we will have on this side um, of the board of the Rio Grande um, to, um, to let us know some movement you know, that happened there if it happened. Um, again, spellings, choosing to abbreviate names, they, names will not always match up. So you have to really think about possible ways to search and the possible names you wanna plug into the searching database to, to find what you're looking for. And then city directories are very helpful. I found them very helpful for my uh, family, especially here in San Antonio. Um, and uh, because they give, uh, you'll see one later, uh, abbreviations um, that uh, you can figure out that tell you things in that, and the older ones in particular, about what was the home, were they renting, is this a store, you know, things like that. So it's very helpful. And then of course, birth, marriage, and death certificates. Um, and church records, um, actually, I found the ones in San Antonio and I've got the link there for San Antonio ones in the family search catalog. Um, there, is, there are a lot of parish um, records digitized. I found my great grandmother's uh, marriage registration at Immaculate Heart of Mary on, on uh, Urban Loop on Santa Rosa Street, I found that there, couldn't find it anywhere else. And because it's it was a record created by the church, um, a sacramental record basically, affiliated sacramental record to her, the sacrament of marriage that she um, had. And so, you know, you'll find the civil registration of the marriage and then if they're Catholic, the sacramental uh, marriage record. So that's really worth exploring, exploring especially if you're from San Antonio. Um, so the, and the city directories, I just found this out, so I confirmed it. Um, usually uh, people search those in a paid subscription site of ancestry.com. Uh, it won't be on the free site and, or they go into a library and find it there where they, they, they don't have to buy their own subscription, they can use the libraries. However, with the San Antonio Public Library, if you have a library card, you go in and create an online account uh, with your library card number and you create a password and all of that. Then there's services, you click on services when you see the account page, then there's databases, you go to H for Heritage Quest Online, you click on that, it'll ask you to log in once again with your San Antonio Public Library, you know, um, number or name and password. And then you're on this page as you see it here, Heritage Quest, US city directories. So you can see I already, I did a screenshot here. I already filled out on the right um, that I want Texas and I want San Antonio. And then I can choose various years and just browse around in that. It's so much fun. I love it. And um, you'll, you know, you have to practice at it and see how it presents and everything, but these are wonderful. And that's a free way to get access 
um, to the city directories. And basically you can see by the, the web link Ancestry Heritage Quest that their ancestry is letting Heritage Quest have access to those city directories. So pretty neat. Um, so this is the first example of um, a city directory um, entry that was useful to me. Starting in Texas, I looked for uh, two generations back for evidence of my parents and grandparents. My parents were born in Texas. My maternal grandparents moved here from Mexico and my paternal uh, grandparents were, were born here. So um, I, um, I look for names in the city directory. And that, that so I say at ancestry.com, but now we know we can find it via Ancestry Heritage Quest. So if you see the little star at the bottom, it says Susie. So at the top, I find the part Morales, that's the last name. And, and then uh, Susie is starred there. EMP, so that means employed. They even tell you and some of these, not, not consistently, but they tell you here what she did for work, which is fantastic. So she worked at the Texas Steam Laundry, L-N-D-Y. H means um, home. And then uh, I think I chopped it off there, but she it, it says one, one, if I didn't chop it off, it would say 1115 Veracruz Street. So I know that and this is 1926 uh, entry. So my mother was born in 1920. So I know that my mother, when she was six years old, lived at 1115 Veracruz Street. So, and I like to create maps. And so if you like to do that, you, you will really get a lot out of using these. Um, here's another um, birth certificate I found in, um, it's in both FamilySearch and Ancestry.com. And we, of course, we also had a family copy, but I, I like to test out what I can find on those databases and it was there. And uh, that's my mother again, uh, in a formal portrait at a, a photograph studio on the West side. And, um, and you can see she's called Ernestina Morales. So my mother's name was Ernestina um, Ernestine, uh, of course, you know how a lot of our people take on then the anglicization names. And so you'll want to keep that in mind too when you're looking for records in the US because there are other records like her death certificate that has Ernestine. So, you know, you have to just keep um, uh, those things in mind. Uh, it says that she was born at 127 Guadalupe on the top, uh, near the top. And that's so that's where they lived. I know that when um, my grandmother uh, had her, um, that structure doesn't exist anymore. I've driven by and it's 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 just like businesses or lots, you know, so so you can't I can't identify um, the structure. And then you can see at the bottom right, it says, you know, who delivered her and it was a Birchelman's MD. And that's also very interesting, too, because Birchelman's was um, a, a German immigrant doctor who, um, I think he came from Germany, if not, maybe he was uh, first generation, but um, he gave house visits to a lot of the Mexican American West Side. And so I thought that was pretty neat to you know, connect up with that. So you see, when you inspect the records for all kinds of things, you can really um, insert your you can build a bigger history around the document than just the data uh, provides. So I think um, we're almost time for questions, but I have a few more minutes. So then, so that was about, you know, US, a couple of US records. When you start to search Mexico records, again, it's important to remember, as I said before that, there's the two surname system so my, my uh, mother, my, let's see. So my name, for instance, um, my name here is Donna Guerra or my middle name is called Morales, but that's actually my mother's surname. So in Mexico, I would be Donna Guerra Morales, right? So we have to remember how we're searching and where we're searching for the conventions of naming people. Um, and then we'll have success, right? Um, and so um, I just put this in, I, you know, I can't, in, I have a dream that codices, you know, codices are the, 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 the indigenous kind of, like you saw with the picture of Molly Nolly, the, the pictographs, you know, and things that, or that you see carved uh, in, um, 
in ruins, both Aztec and Mayan, um, or any other scrolls or wonderful documents that uh, were created by the indigenous populations. I have a dream that codices will be able to be used for genealogy, but that's pretty far-fetched, but I thought I'd state it anyway. And so what, will we, what we will find in these databases um, is Catholic church records, uh, lots of them. They're all in the Spanish language, of course. And so remember that when the Spaniards came to the new world and had that very problematic encounter with the indigenous, um, uh, the, the, the state and the church were one. So basically the government is the Catholic church um, until about 1820 something, no, 1857, yeah. And so, um, so that's when it um, uh, starts to really separate as far as certainly record producing. Um, and so the Catholic church records will have some non-sacramental records, of course, not in the databases so much, but I've been to archives in Mexico city with records that were created by the, you know, the Catholic government that have to do with, you know, giving nobility land uh, because you had pure blood. You know, they always talked about limpieza de sangre. And so um, because, of course, the, the movement toward the new world was so involved with uh, the Inquisition and um, purifying, quote unquote, uh, their concept of pure, keeping Spanish blood pure, particularly in the Americas. And so you would gain favor or land or gifts if you could prove that you had this limpieza de sangre. So you will see that in, in records. Um, but um, but you know you will see other other things too. Those aren't so much in the databases. Mostly, it's sacramental records, baptismal, so not birth. So so when you have a baptismal record in a, a Mexican colonial record, often they say nacido en esta fecha. You know, so it's a different date. Born on this date, it's it's a different date than the baptism date. Um, but they will give you a clue as to when the actual birth was. So that's very helpful. It can be a day after, it can be months after, depending on many things, uh, where they lived in proximity to the main church where they were gonna be baptized. They could, you know, If it's very rural, you maybe have to go to a, a larger city and maybe you can't do that for a while. So all kinds of reasons come up there. Marriage, death, marriage dispensations, for instance. Um, one of the things that makes uh, researching Mexican records so challenging, uh, is that uh, oftentimes our ancestors lived in small municipalities or towns or villas or ranchos, haciendas, different things like that. And they had to, the available pool for marriage were the people right around. And often that was your, those were your cousins. So, so there's a, these dispensations were about uh, going to the, the bishop office and asking for a dispensation, like, please let us get married, your petition to, to for that, even though, uh, you know, we're, we're third cousins, you know, can we get married? And, and I'm really not sure on the basis upon which they said yes or no, but these are the kinds of things that had to happen if you were that closely related to, to the person that you were going to marry. And sometimes they even had the same last name. I've seen that many times. So, interesting things there. And so many of them are not indexed, but you can see once you start using these databases that you can go into collections of records and browse them, which is very time consuming, but really worth the time, I think. And then several registration records. So that's, they're of course also in Spanish language. Um, uh, they, the, the, um, the civil registry starts in 1859 or 60. Um, and uh, it starts producing still many handwritten records, but these are issuing from a government office, so um, which has nothing to do with the church. So you will often find both starting from 1859 and 60, both a church record and a government record, which is even better because it's more, more records you can kind of test your information against. So that's good too. Okay, so it's 1130 and um, I will stop sharing my screen for a second. 
and um, see what questions Natalie might have. Yes, so we have quite a few. Oh dear. Uh -huh. So the first one is, my grandparents have very, very common first and last names. So it's been hard to find information before them. Do you have any advice? Yes. Um, you, that's where it's really important to gather the, the location and uh, birth and death, birth, marriage and death dates, even if they're approximate, even if you're not exactly sure, maybe you have an exact date, maybe you have a year, maybe you have circa, you know, there are lots of circa um, dates and, and information like that. So you really need to plug that in to the databases and uh, play around with that. Um, and so with the location, say if it was, you know, um, some little rancho, I don't know where your people are from, but if they're from Star County, for instance, um, the location, you know, try to go at least county-wide and hopefully that person is attached to a record with that width of um, breadth, I should say, of, um, of a location. And sometimes you can get really specific, you know, and sometimes they will name ranchos as actual locations. So it depends on a lot of things and how the, the in the databases also how the collect the images, what kind of collection they're put into. Um, they could just be called, you know, Hidalgo County Records, you know, 1850 blah to 1910. And then within that, you know, you might want to browse, or if you're not finding exactly through your search fields and parameters, then browsing can be your next step, from finding the collection level of a record, finding the images, and just next, 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 and looking. It can take, again, it can take a lot of time, but I have found things that way that I couldn't find through um, a normal database search. So really make sure you use in your search, not just the names, and think, of course, of alternate spellings and think of nicknames because nicknames are used a lot in these records. You would be surprised, but it is true. And, um, and then also think of misspellings because, again, as I said, in census records, for instance, a lot of U.S. census records, um, a lot of the census takers weren't familiar with the Spanish language. And there are all kinds of crazy misspellings. And another way reason you won't be able to find is because the people, the modern people who index the records in the database, right, who said, okay, this is this, this is this, and they plug it in so we can enter it in the field and find it. Um, they don't know Spanish, so they can't see something that we might say, oh yeah, that's probably Jose Angel. And, um, but they can't see that because they're just not familiar with that. And so they put, you know, some other like un crazy spelling into the field and you'll never find it with that name, of course. So um, that's, that's my answer to your question. Thank you, Donna. The next mm -hmm. question is um, regarding family members that have been adopted, um, in this case, a grandmother. So what are some um, pointers you can give regarding uh, finding adopted relatives? That's really hard. Um, you know, I, if you can get some associated names from other family members, when, uh, from other family members get names that were associated with your grandmother, did you say? And, um, and see if that gives you any clues. So at that point, you're really just like, you know, Harriet the spy, you know, you're, you're looking for clues, you're, you're keeping your eyes open, you're looking for, you know, every little clue that might lead you somewhere. It's not easy. Uh, I, I've never had to research uh, for any adopted relative um, means, but, um, but uh, I do know that some people resort to DNA and they look for matches. They, um, so they go to any one of the, you know, family tree DNA or ancestry. And I have heard of people finding um, relatives that way. And I think there's a, there's a presentation online about that and I can try and share it in the, in the Facebook comments um, afterwards because it does show one guy's success at finding, um, you know, that kind of, resolving that kind of search. So, but you do have many challenges ahead. 
Thank you. The next one, we found the records of family crossing over near the turn of the 1900s, but then lose them after that. They're, they are not on the census records, and we can only find a couple of birth certificates in more recent generations. Any tips on where else to find them? Okay, so assuming you found those birth certificates in the US records, so I think the first thing I would, I would ask myself is, did they stay? You know, because some people don't always stay after they cross or they cross multiple times. Um, I've seen, especially business people or people who are doing some kind of trade with cattle or ranching at the border, they'll go back and forth. And so maybe that crossing record, which it had to be documented, you know, um, uh, maybe it'll say, uh, maybe it'll just be for a particular time and then they, you know, it's not documented when they go back. And so, um, so I would ask those kinds of questions. Are you sure they stayed? Um, and I, I'm, I'm a little not sure how to answer your birth certificate question. Uh, if that, those were um, descendants of those people who crossed, then, you know, search those records uh, where those people were back in time, because you might find your descendants named in one of those records, you know? And so um, often it's very helpful if you can't find the exact people to search siblings, to search brothers and sister, you know, brothers and sisters of those people, or to search their children uh, and then their kids. I mean, you can search around them instead of exactly with them. So for now, I think that that would be my response to you. Wonderful. Next. That is Oh. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why have I not been able to find anyone in the 1940s census? Well, I don't know where they lived. I think it's, um, what well, I think this was from, I believe someone in San Antonio. Okay. But did their, oh yeah. Are they looking for people in San Antonio? I don't know. So, um, so again, remember, you know how when we get the census uh, every year, we can go, eh, I'm not going to fill that out, you know, or, I'm, you know, people aren't at home when it's time to provide the data for the census, any number of, of um, reasons. Uh, maybe they weren't included in the census for one of those reasons or, or others. Um, but, you know, um, the 1940 census is huge, and um, I would say uh, maybe there's some search strategy that's not happening right, or maybe they are under another name, or if you um, know what block they lived on, do you, if you have an address and you know what block they live in on what and what, you know, or if you know any of their neighbors, search their name and, and find out, you know, that it's you, on the census, on the very left-hand side, it says the street street name, and then the address in a little column, dun, dun, dun. And so um, if you could try and find people on those streets, you know, um, or maybe with the keyword thing in the census, they usually don't index the street names though, unfortunately. But um, if you could work around it that way and then start browsing, the you get to the census records and you always see there's a little like going for arrows at the top when you hit the record you want and those arrows just, if you find the street and the neighborhood, just keep going forward, forward, forward. Also check for variant spellings. Uh, and again, the indexer could have put the name in incorrectly. I, I, there's so many reasons why you won't, might not be able to find your 1940 census people, but uh, I don't really know enough to give you like, a much better answer than that. Thank you. Um, do we want, do you want one more? We have about- Sure, why not, why not? And then that I'll get back today. Okay. Mm -hmm. This one, this is an increasing, liter there is an increasing amount of literature on Chicana, Chicano, Jewish ancestry, especially in New Mexico and some in Texas, but next to nothing on Arab and Middle Eastern ancestry. Do you have any thoughts? Gosh, I wish I did because, yeah, um, in Texas, does it say in Texas specifically or? Yeah, it says um, in New Mexico and some in Texas. Oh, okay, but that's for the Jewish, and so well, I'm so, I'm supposing that they want in 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 Texas ish, you know, and because certainly we know that there were lots of Lebanese and Syrian 
people in Mexico, that's a very huge part of the Mexican population. And we also have uh, people that moved here. And we also have a lot of Lebanese and Syrian people here in Texas and in San Antonio. So, um, you know, I'm not sure what to say to that. I would like to explore that further. I wish I could be helpful um, because there are Mexican Arab, you know, um, people. And uh, since our emphasis here is on Mexican, right? And so um, it could be a problem with transliteration. What that means is like, okay, so we know that Arab names um, start off just like Chinese names in a non-Roman script, right? They're in the lettering that is not like what we know as A, B, C, D, E, et cetera. So that has to be made into a, what we call a Romanized sound or lettering system. And then that was, you know, that's what's gonna be plugged into the, these databases that, that I'm familiar with and searching from. So um, right then and there, you've got a huge margin for error. Um, and uh, so that could be one reason, but I, I'm really not satisfied with my answer to you. And I feel like I would need to um, do uh, a lot of um, more research on that because of course, if it's part of a Mexican record, it has been Romanized, it has been Hispanicized. Otherwise, you know, it, it, it couldn't be found in that, that data set. So um, let me follow up. Thank you. And we have a few more, but if you wanna get back and- I wanna get back and then we can do a lot more after um, I'm finished, okay? Okay, so um, we're back to um, the research strategies again. I think this is where I left off, yes. So um, you really should put a lot of practice into searching familysearch.org um, and really think about your research strategies. The good thing about this is that family search itself has a lot of help pages and you can go for further um, tips. And there's actually a lot of stuff on the internet just you know, um, type in to Google, um, searching strategies. Um, I think they might call it Hispanic, gene Mexican genealogy, family search. And I think you'll get a lot of um, help. Uh, so this is just very brief uh, to orient you to what you know, how you'll be thinking about this. But so again, um, who to search for if you don't say, say you have your parents' names, right? Most of us know our parents' names. And, um, but uh, if you don't know beyond then and you don't know who your, it's a mystery who your grandmother was married to or who are, some of the children are, you can begin with a, a marriage search in these Mexican records because the Mexican records are great. They often tell you, um, you know, Jose Angel Guerra married Mauricio Rodriguez on this date, um, hijo legitimo, you know, legitimate son of parents, Don, you know, Antonio Guerra, and then, and then his wife, who they give her maternal name. So these marriage records are most often than not filled with information and data and clues that help you keep going backwards. And they'll also say, uh, Don Antonio and his wife, Maricia, from the village of, you know, or where they were residents of. So then, you know, okay, they lived here. And so, you know, you're suddenly getting all of this information in, in one record. And it's, it's really, you're always so happy when you find stuff like this. Some of them are minimal, especially the more modern records, but the more Mexican colonial records are just packed with information. So um, that's really great. Um, or you could, if you know who their kids are, you could start um, searching for a birth or baptism record for one of them. And then those birth and baptism will name the parents. So uh, there's all kinds of angles at which you can approach searching for an ancestor if you don't have exact information for that one particular ancestor, if you know who their kids were or who their brothers and sisters were and things like that. Um, so, um, so yes, um, and most of these Mexican records are indexed. That means people like you and me usually, um, you can actually participate in familysearch.org index, indexing projects. 
I've done a little bit, and you can actually correct an incorrect entry if you're a registered member, of course. You go in and you you create an alternate field so that with correct name, so that whoever's looking for that will find it. Um, and so that's kind of a cool um, aspect of family search. You can't do that in ancestry. And um, so, but you can try the a variety of searches with the ancestors' name, the parents' names, and or surnames in in a particular locality. Like if I wanted to know, okay, who were all the people? The Guerra, my paternal line is Guerra. They were some of the founders of Mier Tamaulipas, and. Um, and so I think, huh, who were all the guerras in Mier at that time? So I can just type in just the last name Guerra and then put the location, Mexico, and then Tamaulipas, and then fill in some other fields, you know, with Mier or something. And then it'll bring up a, a huge slew of guerras in Mier Tamaulipas because there were tons of them. And um, and then I can just start cruising for names. Say, oh yeah, that looks familiar. That looks familiar. The the the, the edge there is that say one of my ancestors is Jose Angel Guerra. You have no idea how many Jose Angel Guerra's are there, are like hundreds, hundreds, hundreds. So with the uh, location, with some date parameters to search between, you can put in between this year and this year, and then narrow your search, then you can, you know, arrive more, you can more, more likely arrive at a, at a good record that's valuable to your particular ancestry. So in these records, we also find a lot of um, particular words. Um, I know when I first started researching in Mexican genealogy, they were very, a lot of these, uh, uh, Mexic, Spanish is my second language. I learned it um, starting in high school. And, uh, but I grew up around it, you know, and my whole block that I lived on was, you know, Spanish. There were so many Spanish speakers and all Mexican and my schools were Mexican. So I always, my grandparents spoke mostly Mexican. So I'm very familiar, but I never heard these words uh, even after, you know, learning a whole, whole lot of Spanish because they're more in a way, the usage is more colonial Mexico. So espurio, espuria, that's an illegitimate child of either sex. Exposito is a foundling, like a, an orphan, really. Um, feligresia, that's a parish. I had always heard parroquia, but, but feligresia is also a word for parish. Um, and finado, many of you probably know, it was news to me, deceased. So, you know, difunto, finado. Um, H, they use abbreviations like HL for hijo legitimo, legitimate male child, right? Uh, HN, hijo natural, uh, illegitimate child, but maybe they're naming, you know, the parents, but they weren't married, so they're called hijo natural. INO is often for India. Nombre de pila is your Christian name, and that's still in use today. Um, uh, originario, you'll see that a lot, like um, Jose Angel Guerra, ori originario de Marín, Nuevo León, right? That's one of my ancestors. So that means he originates, he came from, um, a town called Marin in the Mexican state of Nuevo León. So you'll see that vecino, also you'll see that uh, a neighbor or citizen, resident of, really, uh, more like resident of. Uh, parvulo is a small child or an infant, and velación, you'll see that in marriage, uh, church marriage documents, it means that the veiling ceremony of the bride and groom. So these are just a few. And so uh, you see that the, the link at the top, that's where you'll go for a much more extensive list and to help you figure out what you're looking at in these Mexican colonial records. So uh, mo many people have heard about the castas. Um, you know, it was implemented by the Catholic Spanish government uh, from the very beginning, because again, you can see there's a whole preoccupation with the um, limpieza, uh, limpieza de sangre, right? So we wanna know where you stand in the social, um, ladder, the social sphere of, of status. And so, of course, you can imagine being puro espanol is like, you can't get any better than that uh, in this system. And I'm certainly not defending it. And, uh, and then it became so complicated. You can see uh, a Spaniard marrying an Indian as a mestiza. It goes on and on. You can study these more later if you haven't already been exposed to these. And um, and so, uh, but ultimately that was a system, it was not a scientific system, of course. Um, it was based upon a visual clue uh, and the two people, but as, as, as we know, as 
um, admixture, as we call it, or, or mixing of, of peoples and pe different people intermarrying becomes so prevalent over the years, you can't tell anything really. Uh, and so of course that system became completely unsustainable. And um, so they abandoned it. I'm not sure, maybe in the 1820 somethings, I'll have to check on that. But they quit putting that into records, but you will see those statuses in the Mexican colonial records, like Jose Angel Marin uh, Español, you know, or any one of these, if that person was put into that category by the parish priest who was visually looking at them and creating their, their marriage record or birth record or whatever it was. So here's an example of a record from 1711. Um, still a little bit earlier where I've underlined, I'm sorry, I don't know how to zoom in, I apologize. Um, but where the underlines are, uh, for instance, this first one here says mulato libre, okay? So a freed slave. And from that previous chart, we can see a mulato was a mixture of a, a Spaniard and uh, an African. So, um, and then we have a coyote, which is another Coyote, right here, that person was put into that classification. And then here's a mestiza. And then this one is also a mestizo. So you can see that these things, or you can see Espanol, okay, Espanol. And sometimes it says ESP. You can see here with a little MO above abbreviation, or NO abbreviation. And that's, you'll see many kind of strange abbreviations that with repetition and looking at these records, you will come to know um, what they mean. Um, so this is a, a photograph, the only, only one of two photographs we have of my great-grandfather, Jeronimo Guerra, and he was my paternal great-grandfather. And he was born in Mier, Tamaulipas on October 3rd, 1875 and moved uh, with his father, Jose Angel, and mother, Mauricio Rodriguez, to Roma, Texas, and Tienditas Ranch, which is right on the other side of the you know, Rio Grande, and later settled in Kennedy, Texas, um, in Duval County, and died in 1942. So for a long time, I did find his uh, death record easily, but for a long time, I couldn't find it. Um, his gravestone until finally someone on Find a Grave, which I'll talk to you about later, actually a, a remote cousin of mine, uh, went to and, and photographed the headstones of, of all of our people and put them in the database that is Find a Grave. Um, and finally, I found out where exactly he was buried because his, his death record didn't indicate clearly where his burial site was. So that was very exciting for me. Um, and so, uh, and he's married, uh, buried next to my great grandmother, Concepcion. But um, that was very hard to find uh, some records on him until I had a little more data. And I had to be very patient. And uh, it's like 10 years till I found his uh, death information. And then just last year, I found his marriage document, which I didn't put on here, but. Um, it had, and the reason I couldn't find it, and I found it by browsing records in Duval County, is because they had his name as Jerome, not Jeronimo, right? And then I forget they had something else completely wrong for my great grandmother's uh, first name. So I just can never think, okay, maybe I'll search Jerome. That never came into my mind, even though I try to think of various ways to search these records. So. It's, it gets that way. You, you really um, have to sometimes be patient and sometimes just happily come upon it. And sometimes they're not digitized till later too. So you have to repeat your searches, you know, every so often, like at least once a year to see if something's changed. So here is the 1900 Duval census. And, um, and so I have a star next to my uh, great grandfather, Jose Angel Guerra, his wife, Mauricia, um, their children at the time who were living with them, uh, Jeronimo, that's my great-grandfather, my, my great-grandfather, no, so this is my great-great-grandfather, sorry, and then that's my great-grandfather, Jeronimo, and his sister, Vicenta, and his brother, Francisco, but the way these were indexed, uh, Francisco, you can see it's got a weird little abbreviation that was listed as FAMCO, F-A-M-C-O, 
And Jose Angel was something completely, they, and that is hard to read, granted, but um, uh, they had Jose Angel as something completely different. So I couldn't find these, this record for a long time, but then finally I, I found it. So, um, so that's wonderful. And then I, of course I check against, you know, the has date of immigration and it's, and date of month and year of birth and more or less these to the side of more they matched um, because those can be given incorrectly to the census taker for a variety of reasons as well. So again, Heronimer, we're stuck on him. Um, this is his, so, so by the time he was born in 1875, there were also civil birth records. And uh, so this is his, um, um, this is that for him. And it says in the city of Mier uh, at five in the afternoon on October 7th, uh, 1875, the um, citizen Nicolas Rodriguez, uh, 20 years of age um, and um, shoe, uh, horseshoe maker uh, by, by uh, profession, uh, presented this uh, child to this um, municipality who was born on the third of the present month, which was October. So I know that he was born on October 3rd. Um, and I sign here the name of Jeronimo Guerra, and he's the legitimate child of the residents Jose Angel Guerra and Mauricio Rodriguez, um, mayores de edad, meaning I guess older adults and residents um, here. And, and it tells also the names of the, the, grand, the godparents and all of that. And it says, um, so that's, excuse me, that's a lot of information. And um, so I was happy to find uh, that particular record. We're going much further back in time. And uh, this is the marriage of my, um, gosh, fifth paternal great grandfather and mother. And, but this is on my paternal side, so he's a guerra. And um, he's marrying Maria Josefa Martinez, dispensados a cuatro grados de consanguinidad. So they were, they're related, um, you know, they're fourth cousins and they had to get, they officially got their permission to marry. Um, otherwise it wouldn't say that they have the dispensation. Um, and they married on June 14th, 1744 at the city cathedral uh, in Monterrey, Nuevo León, Mexico. Um, and so this also gives the, the names of the bride and groom where they were born as well as their parents and uh, the witnesses. So, um, and this is, a, this is a church record. And you can see on the left-hand side, it says Ignacio Guerra y Maria uh, Josefa Martinez, um, uh, Españoles, you can hardly see it, it's faded out. Españoles dispensados, you see the little four, four G, E I G L de sang. So these are all the weird uh, abbreviations you're gonna find, but that means dispensados cuatro grados de, de consanguinidad, right? So <laughs> you'll get used to it. And you'll also have to practice reading um, this more colonial script uh, that is very different from today's cursive. Uh, again, this is an even earlier record from 1624 um, because the paternal side of my family uh, came from Llanes Asturias in Northern Spain and went directly to Mexico City. It was only over the years that I can trace how they moved up and then up into South Texas. So this is the paternal side, um, last name Guerra. Um, it's my ninth great grandparents, Antonia Guerra Canamal Porras. He was born in Asturias, as it says in 1603, and, but this is a Mexican record uh, because he gets married to a woman named Luisa Hernandez de Rio Frio at the, um, the city um, uh, cathedral in Mexico City on December 22nd, 1624. So that's how I've been able to go that way on my paternal line. My maternal line is a totally different story. So um, I've been trying and trying. And in fact, at this moment in time, I'm not even sure. I, I just discovered something that puts this record into question as part of my lineage, but I'm sharing it anyway, um, because I was trying to just research mother to mother to mother to mother to mother on my maternal side. 
And again, all kinds of issues with, you know, the paternal name sticking, the husband, the marriage name sticking around or absence of being married and just a partner. Lots of that on my mother's side. So that even makes it more difficult. People didn't always get married to have babies. And so um, Feliz is on the left-hand side, it says Feliciano Paredes Mulato con Maria Cayetana Costa Española, ambos del, and then the, the town, and I forget what it is at this very moment. But you can see uh, this is a, an 1847 record from Guanajuato where they did assign, you know, the, the casta um, to, to the people involved. So I wanted to show that to you too. That's really it for the most part today. Again, this is a brief overview. These are some really great websites um, for South Texas and North Mexico genealogy. I'm a member, I'm on Facebook. So for those of you who are, and you don't already belong, you might wanna join the We Are Cousins Facebook group by a really nice and experienced researcher named Moises Garza. And so uh, that's the Facebook link. And then that is his personal page link through which he has links that go to many, many pages of, uh, of great use for uh, Mexican uh, genealogy in South Texas and Mexico. He has you know, presentations on there. It's just really, he's a, a great guy. There's another great guy um, that I uh, interact with when I need to named Crispin Rendon. And he lives in California and he has a massive database of, of, uh, that he's put together over many years of family lineages um, and uh, they, they, he's ho he and another uh, person are hosting a site called Genetic Primos. Okay, so I haven't said much about DNA, <laughs> but I've done all my DNA and that has really helped my um, genealogy. But I just wanted, this was a beginner, so I just wanted to really stick to the, the beginner strategies. But the Genetic Primos uh, web link that you see here has many family lineages on it that aren't related to DNA and it has other reports on it that he has put together based on DNA. He has also done some really interesting reports on maternal DNA, which is its own particular kind of DNA that both men and women can take the test. It's called mtDNA, and it goes only back to show the lineage of, say, my mother, her mother, their mother, 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 all the way back. Great for Mother's Day, right, to think on that stuff. And so, um, he has gone back to some um, really early uh, indigenous female um, lineages. And so he hasn't gone back to mine, unfortunately. And he does that by what's called the, the mtDNA genetic group, or they call it haplogroup. And, uh, and just so you're aware too, as we, you know, as I stated in the very beginning a little bit, um, the, the, because, the Spaniards, I, um, I think I'm correct in this, um, that they were only, when they came to the Americas, Las Indias, as they, excuse me, called it, so that includes the Caribbean, right, Cuba and all of us, and, and Puerto Rico, um, they could only bring women they were already married to and their children if they decided to do that. Some of them didn't because they didn't know what kind of situation they were jumping into. But yes, Spanish women came, and then, um, but, you know, uh, through um, perhaps violence uh, or perhaps some coercion, uh, Spaniard men very quickly, and I think they were given permission by the royal, the, you know, Isabella and Ferdinand to, um, to partner with indigenous women that were living here. So there are something called the 15 founder lineages of maternal DNA in, in Mexico, and it just turns out that most of us who are Mexican American, when we take that mtDNA test, so many of us um, have a, 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 the results that are from one of the 15 founder female indigenous lineages. So, um, you know, it's not surprising, but it's a, it helps to open your eyes, you know? So that's that's on that. And you should really visit the and download. You can download the reports on, on that site. The South Texas Heirs of Las Porciones, I like because it's a Facebook page. Um, it, um, you know, a lot of us owned land 
in the on the other side, and of course on both sides of the Rio Grande, uh, when we were here much earlier than the European Americans. And so, um, so yeah, um, there are lots of uh, discussions of um, trying to figure out what those lands were. Wonderful graphics sometimes, people share great maps, um, have discussions about families. I really think that's a, a great uh, Facebook page to explore. I don't know of a non-Facebook page that deals with that. Maybe there is one, but I don't know about it. So. Uh, you're bound to Facebook for that one. And then there's another site called Hispanic Genealogical Information. And that has all kinds of great information on it. You should definitely explore that. It has a lot of surnames that you can click on and, and interesting information. And then of course on Family Search, they have that whole link there on Mexico genealogy, which has all kinds of great tips and tricks for, for figuring out you know, who your people were. Um, and then, uh, so as far as the databases, so the previous, you know, was about, you know, Mexican genealogy, and this is more about just general, but you will find, of course, Mexican stuff there, which is the general link for family search. Uh, family search has just mega, you know, it says, it says billions of digit, 5.7 billion digital images. Of course, not all of those are Mexican related, but they're always trying to um, add more, which is kind of amazing. So um, definitely you want to register for free there. Um, and then uh, the Ancestry.com Texas, that's got its own name because that's um, uh, sponsored by the Texas State Library and Archives Commission. So if you, it's a free registration and you go to that link that I showed you there and you register just for that, they give you access um, to all of the records that are Texas related that are on Ancestry for free. Um, again, it's only Texas related, but that could really be helpful if you don't have a paid subscription Ancestry account. And then uh, at Ancestry, of course, proper, you can go for that registered guest account, go to that link. It'll tell you to how, to, how to register. Again, don't register for a trial. It'll prompt you to do that. You want the registered free guest account. So it'll never ask you to input a credit card or ask you like, are you ready to you know, purchase? Or it might ask you that, but because they're kind of hard sell, but um, you, know, you can stay free all the time again with information that you might get. And then you can go search on family search to see if you find the, the whole document. And then find a grave, um, which is really, um, I, I have a registered free account and I have submitted pictures of my family members' gravestones and other cousins have submitted pictures and I can attach relatives to those graves, gravestones if I am the owner and manager of the profile. If I'm not, I can email the manager, either one, say, this is my direct descendant, may I please assume management? And or if they don't want to do that, say, can you please add this data and make these connections? So um, usually they're pretty nice uh, and they let you assume management if it's your direct descendant. So um, I, I also use that site a lot. And so with that, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and to my mother. And um, I guess we'll get back to questions. Okay, thank you so much, Donna. Mm -hmm. And so the first question that we left off with was, do you consult individuals? Of course, that's, you know, like I said, my brother did a lot of that in the 80s. And, I, and we have, and even since then, we've, we've had a, a revisit with one of those, uh, our older relatives and, you know, had some food and, but had our questions kind of ready and things we wanted to clarify if they could be clarified. Because, uh, you know, human memory and um, especially when we're quizzing our older relatives, it, it can be you know, off. And so, but, you know, just like Laura Hernandez Arisman was talking in her oral history presentation last month, I think she said this anyway, um, that, uh, you know, you, these are for the lived experience, you know, and this is for the remembrances. Yes, some data will be right on and true, and some of it will be not not accurate but you know you honor those people for their um for their stories of 
of, of the family and what they are able to tell you. And so at worst, you get nothing useful. At best, you get the truth with some great clues. So yes, if, you, if your family members are around, always, always, because that gives you more, um, you know, the consultation of them gives you more data for your record search, definitely. All right, and I don't, and that might have been read too, like, do you personally, like, will you work with maybe community members to help them find answers too? Um, and I know you do, I think you do. <laughs> I have, uh, you know, COVID has changed everything. And frankly, um, sometimes when we'd have, you know, Paseos del West Side, for which this is also, um, you know, a, a virtual part of the uh, 2021 Paseo del West Side, I could be present, we would give presentations. I could have little sessions where I could sit down with people and just help them through searches. You know, I've had workshops in person pre-COVID at the Casita, I've had them at the Esperanza. And so um, this is not ideal, this virtual approach, but um, yes, I love to help. I love to help community members do that. And, um, you know, I, I'm pretty busy these days, but I, I would like to set up like a session one day when we can get back together um, uh, to have something in person and have a little just practice searching, you know, um, workshop, that's all, you know, and, uh, and to help people. But you know, people can always um, send me an email. I will get back to you as soon as I can. Sometimes I, I don't always get back so soon, which I, I wish I could, but I've got a whole lot of things going on. And so, um, and, you know, including my day job and whatnot. So, um, but um, yes, um, I do help. And I think it's very important. And one of the, my dream projects really um, is like to get you know, the women that we've added to the Museo of the West Side in the virtual exhibit that we have um, at museo del westside.org called the Women in Act Activism in the, in the West Side. I'd love to like someone to start researching each of those women's genealogy and find all the records, you know, and, and kind of support that. And um, because I really do obviously strongly feel that a, a research through records can really enhance, um, you know, our historical efforts, our efforts at creating history. Yeah, that would be really nice. Yeah. <laughs> that will be really nice. It will be really nice. The next question is, could you explain the double surname system? I have found ancestors which appear to use the double, the same double surname over three generations. Right. Well, um, that's something that comes from Spanish speaking countries, wherever they are, South America, Central America, Spain, um, Philippines, I think. Um, uh, and certainly Mexico. And uh, it's a system, and I don't really know the origin of it, um, but I'm sure it's quite, you know, paternalistic in nature. <laughs> Just as, as our single, you know, marriage system here is paternalistic in nature, the way we take um, the, the, the spouse's name or the husband's name. Now, I know a lot of people hyphenate, and that's really great too. It's the way they can remain present uh, with their identity in their, um, in their name. And, and most people do that actually, or many people do that nowadays, but that system, I'm sure that there's a really fascinating uh, article somewhere that talks about its origins in uh, embedded in a you know, social context of, of um, status driven Spain. And so, but basically again, what it is like my name, Donna, Guerra in the United States, or, or actually my birth certificate is Donna Morales Guerra, because my we took my mother's last name as my middle name. Not everybody does that. They have like a Christian name as their, you know, Donna Marie Guerra or something, but mine is Donna Morales Guerra. In Mexico, as I said, I would switch the order. I would be Donna Guerra Morales. And even their forms, when you fill out their forms, you know, um, uh, their, their fields are, you know, I forget how they're named, apellidos, apellido, and then something else. And, um, but, you know, they always put the, the, your father's last name first, and then your mother's last names. So everything in their computerized systems, everything in their forms is geared toward knowing that that name that comes right after your, or the first apellido, the first last, 
surname that comes right after here. If you have a slew, Dona Maria, Catalina, blah, 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 Guerra, Moral, you know, that could be a name too. There are many names like that. And so um, that first surname that comes is your, you know, your official uh, last name. I'm afraid that's the best explanation I can give in this moment. But so that's why, but, it, but the, the why it's important to us, particularly in searching records, is that you want to make sure that, um, you know, for in, in the family search database, you're putting in um, the an ancestor, you're putting in the last name as the, the father's last name. Now, you know, I, I did try a little ancestry.mx, Ancestry Mexico, a little free account. Can't do much with it, but the fields are different than an ancestry. They have the, you know, the father's last name field and they have the mother's, they have separate fields for both. In the US and our databases, we only have first name, last name. So interesting. That is interesting. <laughs> what are sources to search photographs of relatives? In particular, has anyone cataloged photographer files? Yeah, um, that's sort of when we're talking about um, searching records and databases, there, we're not really focusing on photographs, although you can find some family trees if they're public, you know, in your search results and you kind of see what the results are, you can see family trees. You might click on some of those and then some are private, like you click on the tree and it says, you know, you must request access to this you know, tree, or some of them are public, and you can see their whole gallery of, um, of images, and often it's of records, and many times of photographs. I found some of uh, a beautiful photograph of one of my uh, great, great, great aunts that way. Um, but, um, you know, so I wouldn't say that they're cataloged, they are attached to family trees, or to family galleries that are created by some of the people who have created family trees. And that's something I didn't talk about. And I'm sort of glad you prompt that because in family search, you can create a family tree with your free registered account. The only thing you wanna watch out for is that anyone can go in and change your tree. You can't protect it, you can't lock it. So anyone who might be looking for that same ancestor or thinks that your ancestor is their ancestor and they're not, anyway, they can go in and make all kinds of changes. Ancestry, um, they are public and private, but nobody can change them but you. Of course, to do that, you have to have a paid subscription account. Um, then there's myheritage.com, which I didn't mention. Um, I have a paid account there, and I have a very extensive family tree there. Um, and you can attach photographs to that. So I think I'm, I'm thinking in terms of what we're talking about today and the databases is attaching photographs to things, um, not um, cataloging photographs. Um, you, I think um, looking for that would be, I have never seen a cataloged database of photographs strictly for genealogy. You would have to find them as attachments to to uh, family trees, I think, or some families create their own web pages and they slam a bunch of photographs there, but not a, there's no such thing really as a cataloged database for um, and um, doing genealogy of, of photographs. Thank you. Where could we find links to church records, both in Mexico and Texas? So uh, in my presentation, uh, which you know, you'll be able to see afterwards on YouTube. I don't know how, how, how long afterwards, Natalie, does that take to get onto YouTube? It should be um, instantly. So as soon okay. as we watch it. Okay, so if you cruise through and you can stop, right? Oh, because it's a video, right, um, on YouTube. And you'll see the pages. And I have one of those pages, as I showed you, um, church, uh, um, I forget what I called it, but here, well, let me just go here. Again. Okay, see this right here, church records, family search catalog, San Antonio, Texas. So if you go to that um, link 
And then you start plugging in that, look, there's a field for location, right? And so just plug in San Antonio, Texas, or whatever location you're looking for, whatever records are, are um, digitized and indexed there and, and are digitized there, you will be able to see them. Um, so when I plugged in San Antonio and I, there's, there's San Fernando Cathedral records and there's different parishes. I think Our Lady of Guadalupe has some. I found Immaculate Heart of Mary there. That's where I found my, uh, my great grandmother's marriage record uh, that was you know, cited by the priest at the church. Um, so again, when you have time, but you know, depending on the place where you plug it in, um, you can do that. Now, I just went through a whole series of talking about Mexico, so that's US, right? I went through a whole series of those records that I showed you all, many of them were, were church records as I showed you. So um, maybe, so, so just go to um, uh, Family Search. Maybe it would help if I actually did a search for you. Okay. One second, I'm signing in. Then I'm going to screen share again. Okay. Oh, where am I? Oh, wait. Yeah. Okay. okay. So here I am at Family Search, right? I'm logged in, Donna Guerra, see? And uh, so I go to search, click on that. You want records. And so you can do this any number of ways. I like to click on the country. See where I'm clicking here, Mexico. Um, then if I know which state I want, like I want Nuevo Leon, you can see I search it a lot because I have a lot of ancestors that come from there. Um, you can start filling in names. The only limitation here is that um, you have to know the names and, and they have to be indexed. So I like to search, go down here to these records and where you can browse. So it said show all eight, see Mexico baptisms. Well, you know, that's gonna be a church record because only churches baptize. Deaths, that could be either church or civil, I don't know. Um, but from the dates, I'd say 1680, I'd say they're church. Uh, Mexico marriages, again, from the dates, church, national census, 1930, Mexico, uh, Nuevo Leon Catholic church records, civil registration. Okay, that's government. You can see it starts at 1859. What did I say before? That the, the church and state separated and 1859 starts the registry of government records. And then for some reason, Zacatecas is in here. I'm not sure why uh, they may have some Nuevo Leon records. Sometimes that happens across the states. But so I would want to go here. I'm clicking on Nuevo Leon Catholic Church records. So um, you can also hope that your ancestor is indexed, but if not, this is time consuming. You cruise down and you say, view images in this collection, browse through 447,381 images. Frankly, I don't mind doing that sometimes. So, um, and then it gives you uh, all the towns that you can choose. Remember, we're still all in church records and this is just for one state in Mexico. So there's hundreds and hundreds of records. So um, just so you can see that, um, do what I, follow the search that I did and uh, choose the, again, early on, choose the state that you want. And then you can, you know, click down and you'll find the towns and um, go from there. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you for that short demo. And we did include yeah. um, the link in the Facebook chat. Oh, good. Okay, super. Does San Fernando number one and number two give out info regarding past fam family burial locations? Find a grave isn't that helpful always. Right. Find a grave has is not exhaustive. It has not, the whole cemetery is not, you know, Digit is, is not photographed, right? Um, usually what spurs find a grave are just you know, citizens who like to do that sort of thing. There are retired people who have all the time in the world and go around and do that, which I'm grateful for them. Um, but often it's spurred by us wanting to document our own family members. 
So um, that's why if you create a free uh, account and you don't find your ancestor in either one of those cemeteries, go to the cemetery, take a photograph, create your own record, and then they're there, right? Um, but as to your question, I have had a difficult time myself. I was trying to find my great grandmother's burial documents. And, um, and it was, they're very privacy driven there. I feel a little bit on the side of, you know, come on guys, you know, this, this person's been deceased since 1940 and, you know, 1930, whatever it is. But uh, they did ask me, they said, can you uh, prove you're related. I went, well, there's nobody. I mean, all of those generations are gone, but I can bring you the, the death certificates, I suppose. Anyway, I provided a little bit of information and they gave me a little bit of information. They also said, they also told me that, as you always hear, there was a fire and a lot of the documentation for a lot of the early graves, um, I forget when the fire was, but a lot of the records were lost. So that's always, we never like to hear that. But um, so, yeah, I would try be very friendly, be very understanding, don't be pushy, <laughs> even though you want to say, I wanted to be pushy, I wanted to say, that's my great grandmother, come on, you know, um, but you know, you got to settle back and, you know, they're working with a lot of parameters there and the people at the desk don't always, they're just trying to follow the instructions. And so um, I would start uh, at the desk and say, you know, I would like information on um, this ancestor or where they're buried. I'm assuming that's what you're looking for. Um, or if you have anything with this last name, I have um, actually asked at San Fernando number three, they do have a listing by last name and you can ask them, is this person with this last name and full name and this is when they died, are they in the cemetery? And they're like, they can tell you yes and at what plot and site and you know, uh, grave. And so I think they would do the same thing too. And I think they did do that with me, with my great grandmother at number two, San Fernando, but I wanted the paperwork, you know, because there were some clues I were hoping was on it. And uh, they just gave me like, they wouldn't share the actual paperwork with me though they shared a little bit of information with me. Thank you. How would you identify that? How would you identify an ancestor that is indigenous? What do you, I'm not sure what identify means or find. Yeah, probably. Okay. Uh -huh. um, um, it's, it's so challenging. I mean, work is starting to be done on making all kinds of records about our indigenous ancestors available. Um, again, so I, and that's non, you know, people that are from different territories, right? Um, not just um, South Texas, not just Mexico, uh, things like that. There's a whole movement and I'm really glad for it. Um, but um, really uh, the, the most important thing to do again is, you know, ask your family members, start doing that inquiry. Like, have you ever heard that we have Native American blood, right? American Indian blood. Um, and then start doing the genealogy because remember that record that I showed you that had one of my maternal ancestors as a mulatto? Like, I never would have known that. It's just through going back and back and back, you start to see things. And that's how most people discover that. Um, now, if one was searching to, you know, be part of um, a group, uh, it, you know, if one has motivation to prove to some governing body of today or somehow make a claim that had, you know, repercussions outside of just doing, doing genealogy on their Native Americanness, that might be problematic. It might not be enough. It's the same problem that a lot of people who are trying to establish their Jewishness have. Um, yeah, you know, or uh, you know, you can say, well, my DNA shows that I was Jewish, but, you know, you need a paper trail, you need evidence that these people were, were practicing. And of course, that was a suppressed history. And uh, it's unless you, your family members kept excellent records over the years, or you have great resources, that's going to be hard to prove too, although people are doing it. Um, and so, um, same situation in a way, but even even I think worse for 
for Indigenous people because, um, again, another horribly suppressed history um, and uh, record keeping, you, you know, non Indigenous record keeping was not great and uh, names were not assigned to people and wrong names. And, and then record keeping within indigenous people's communities was also very different from this Western style of, you know, fill out a form and this and this and this until later when they were kind of forced to adopt that form. So there's all kinds of challenges and I wish I could help you, but my, my best, my best um, advice is ask your family members and, um, and uh, keep, working that genealogy backwards because people have found, oh, look, Indio, like it says my, you know, uh, ancestor was an Indio or an Indio. And then sometimes based on where they lived, you know, where that record is based because you're researching it, you can say, oh, that community was mostly like, um, you know, Comanche people. Okay, I wonder, if, you know, she was a Comanche. So you can sometimes come away with educated guesses and often no confirmed information, but educated guesses are, are important. Thank you, Donna. And we do have quite a few more. I want to. I'm okay to stay on if uh, people, of course, probably have left, but you know, if there are enough people on, I, I'm happy to. Perfect. Yes. No, people are sticking around for sure. Okay. Um, how do you advise searching for family members who fled a Mexican city, San Luis Potosi, to Waco, Texas for a crime they committed? Oh, yeah. So see, those are the kind of people who would want to be under the radar sometimes as far as censuses and, and being, you know, having their presence documented. That's, uh, that's the first thing I think of, uh, you know, they might really want to be, I don't know if, you know, they were pursued from Mexico. Uh, but um, again, if those family members had, you know, brothers or siblings or children, you could start searching the children of the siblings. Right. And uh, of course, searching in places where you think they might have been or where you know they were. Uh, say in Waco, I would start in Family Search searching that last name in Waco, Texas. Um, if you have an idea of when they got there, you might set there are date parameters in those searches. You know, this year, between this year, you can change those and, um, and then see what kind of results you get. And just start exploring. Sometimes that's really what you have to do. Um, you're not going to just punch in the like, boom, there magically is exactly the information you were looking for. It's probably never going to happen that way. So um, so you realize that doing this kind of research is uh, it's a time commitment and you just have to be impassioned by it enough to spend the time. So, um, but that's what I would do. I would, if, you know, if, if the people who, the proper, the, the names exactly of the people that, you know, were, were, were prob, you know, they weren't gonna want themselves to be found probably, right? So they weren't gonna want themselves to be documented. Um, if you know they had any siblings or, or uh, children, I would go that direction, research them. Thank you. Or they might, and this is just me thinking, yeah, yeah. As, they might yeah. have gone by a different name. That's true, but then how would you know those names, right? I mean, so it's about what you know and then what you can find out, right? But that's, that's, that's true. They, that's absolutely right. This community member said, my dad went to Lanier in the 1920s, but not sure where my mom went to school, but she did live on Chihuahua Street. Are there any pictures from the west side of San Anto from the 20s and 30s, as well as school records of children? I've never seen that. There are some yearbooks I've seen on the, but usually from high school. Uh, but there may be some that I haven't seen and, and, and things change. On, on paidancestry.com, I've seen yearbook pictures come up a lot. Um, and so, but I haven't seen grade school so much. Um, so, uh, yeah, and that's, you know, assuming they're digitized. Not everything's digitized. We always have to remind people not everything's digitized. And that digitization happens on an ongoing basis. So, I mean, a year from now, lots more things are going to be digitized as far as those databases. But, you know, we don't know what they're going to be. Um, you might um, see if... Uh, if some 
community members um, have yearbooks from the years that you can guess that your uh, mother uh, would have attended and uh, and then just do a call out, you know, for that somehow. Um, you know, I don't know if Lanier has an alumni office. You would want to find that out. Um, and so, and they may have a collection of yearbooks there. So it could be a matter of if it were possible to go in there and say, I just want to see the yearbooks from between this year and this year. I'm hoping to find my mother in them. Um, and then you just have to go through the process of elimination and then whatever, you know, Brackenridge, I don't know. Uh, if you, you knew where your mom lived, so that's helpful. Um, so yeah, those are probably the two most likely high schools, right? I think. And then if you can think of any other high schools. So yeah, it's, it's not a quick and dirty process that you are looking at, but those are the ways to think about it. Wonderful. This community member says that their family lived on the estate at Brackenridge Park when they first came to the U.S. How can they find more information on this? They've already tried contacting Brackenridge Park. Yeah, um, I don't know. Contact the city municipal archives. Sometimes they have things related to big public, you know, or tracts like that. Um, were they Asian American, I'm wondering, but because I didn't know many people who lived on the tract. But anyway, um, I would contact the city archives. Um, um, they, they sometimes they have interesting related maps and articles that show the names of people who lived on the tracts of land. And again, I don't know what years you're talking about, but that sounds like the 1800s. And so, um, so yeah, that's what I would do. Have you ever traveled to Mexico to conduct genealogy research? If so, yes. <laughs> describe and answer if it was worth it to you. You know, um, access to Mexican archives is really uh, um, difficult. It's, I mean, it's hard enough here. <laughs> But it's really hard there. And, um, you know, sometimes you have to prove that you've got credentials that um, enable you to be a worthy visitor of the archives, you know, a serious investigator. So I would say if you want to just do, you know, if you don't have an affiliation, that's going to be really hard. Um, if you can get a letter of introduction from um, someone, a professor, or say that you're participating in some project, whatever it is. Um, they will be more, look more kindly upon letting you in. Of course, I'm sure they're all closed now for COVID, but this was when I, I did it before COVID and I did have some affiliations that enabled me to get in. And so, um, so that's one thing, one level access. Um, so I just, I'm not trying to discourage people, but I'm saying, you know, it's a hurdle, it's a hurdle. And you know, you, it may not, it may be more worth your time to use the, the, the gazillions of records in Mexican records on family search than trying to get inside and work in a, an actual Mexican archives. So, um, but um, it was worth it. Um, I did find some citations um, that were possible family members, but I still, I have all the, you know, and they let you take photographs without flash and took gazillion photographs. And uh, I was going through some of the early um, land, uh, gifting of land to nobility kinds of papers that were in a, the municipal archives in Mexico City. And um, so, um, you know, there were lots of ghettos in there. I just didn't know they were mine. And so it was more like, I, See, and I'm one of those people who gets great joy from doing archival research. So for me, it's always wonderful, you know. Um, but, um, you know, because I, I was able to accept that I might not find anything relevant to my search. That's one thing. So valuable to you. It depends on what your expectations are. Was it worth it? Hmm. So um, I've also gone to Spain, to northern Spain, to Asturias, to do research on my paternal, paternal line there in their city archives. And that was also wonderful, but you know, they don't have great indexes going on. So you just kind of like ask for a book that you, between years that you think will be helpful to you and you just start browsing through it, taking photographs, you know, and, but you, you're learning a lot too about the context of life in, in that place. So, um, so worth it is very relative. And, um, but again, the wealth, for the wealth of record, Mexican records that are available in, 
in uh, on family search i think for most researchers that's your best archives quote unquote to to enter thank you have you heard of a practice for adopted children in Mexico to retain their biological fathers and or mother's names? No, no I know nothing about that. Sorry. No it's interesting though. Yes. What affordable software do you recommend to develop family trees? Um, you know, because I use an online one. Um, I know there's one that people tend to like a lot. I think one that Moises Garza, who, you know, I take my cues from him sometimes and recommendations like this. He seems to like family tree maker. And, uh, you know, I don't know how affordable that is, but I think it is more affordable than perhaps others. So, uh, and easy to use and easy to understand. And so that's if you want your own standalone software. I use MyHeritage online and... You can get a fairly inexpensive uh, account. Um, again, that's relative. I forget what I pay, but um, I have a very huge uh, family tree there. And um, and then if you wanted to stop using that, there's the ability to download. I think they call it a GEDCOM file, G-E-D-C-O-M. It's uh, like it's the structure of a, a family tree um, kind of file. And um, and then you could possibly upload that into another kind of software if you decided to do a standalone on your on your computer kind of software. Again, the one I'm talking about is hosted online, so I don't have to buy any software. I don't have to set it up. Um, I just plug in stuff online. Thank you. And are most Mexican records available online? No, I wouldn't venture to say that, but you know how many thousands and thousands and thousands of Mexican records there are? There, so many of them are available online. But um, yeah, no, not all Mexican records are online. Because a lot of the digitization um, projects that have made these records possible have been conducted by um, entities external to Mexico, right? Who had money and resources and, and wanted to do this. So, um, so, but then again, Mexican repositories that are local to Mexico, all over Mexico, are starting to, um, to begin to put a lot of things online. Um, some things that I found that are books uh, say books that contained the wills of my some of my ancestors, very informative. You know, it really gave a picture of, you know, their wealth or not wealth, their who they wanted to give their property to. Um, so that was, I think, I got that. You know, um, at the one of the universities in Nuevo León, and um, but and so slowly more repositories in Mexico are putting things online, but um, in Mexico, there's a real, it's hard to find really user-friendly interfaces and inf technological infrastructure. So often those things that are online are really not intuitive to search and I find them confusing too. Um, the fields aren't set out like, you know, really, nicely so that I can make choices that I'm, you know, feel confident in. So, um, but it's growing. So, but yeah, unfortunately not, not all. And, 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 and I guess, do they need to be, do all Mexican? No, I don't know. That's an ongoing question, but, but for genealogy, there's, again, there's, there's a lot, but they are not all online. And we have a last couple of questions. What does born old Mexico on a death certificate mean to you? <laughs> oh, brother. Oh, that's funny. Um, somebody who was filling it out to, well, had some kind of mindset. Um, you know, saying Mexico is sufficient, but I don't know. I don't know when, what date this, uh, this uh, record or what county it's from, or, you know, like the date could affect the speech style, right? We would never say that now. We would just put Mexico, but maybe it was some early, you know, 18 after, you know, the, the border crossed us, as we say, um, record. 
that uh, still really made that kind of reference to the other side of the river. I mean, and so it's not, it doesn't necessarily mean it's offensive. I see, I, that was my bias showing. I assumed it was offensive, but maybe it isn't. Maybe, um, maybe it's just like trying to say like the other side of the river or something. Again, context and knowing more about that record would mean everything and me trying to say why I think it said that and what it means. You know, sometimes you can't ask these, or you can, of course, but you can't get a good answer if you don't know more about the record itself. If you know just about a line in it, sometimes that you need more information to interpret a little better. But I would say it, it, it means the other side of the river. That's just me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What, and this is kind of similar to um, the previous question you answered about possibly finding indigenous ancestors, but what resources are there to identify if your ancestors are listed as a part of a specific Native American tribe already? Yeah, that's, um, that's just, that's just very difficult. Um, as I said, some of going back in the Mexican, there aren't like just these group resources that tell that that doesn't exist yet, maybe in the future. So much depends on all of the, the work that's being done right now. This is a new field and a new part of the field, I should say, is really people trying to get a handle on the, in, the indigenous parts of their past and, um, and the documentation of, of their presence um, and in, you know, on both sides of the border. So, um, but again, uh, sometimes uh, some of the Mexican records do say Indio uh, Tlaxcala, in, you know, Indio Tlaxcala or something, you know, that tells you right there, you know, then you know what you need to know. Um, but not all of them do. And some of them do say the tribe and some of them just say Indio. And so um, sometimes I found that some in Northern Mexico uh, in the 1800s seem to, especially like in the areas, you know, where there are a lot of Tarumara living or um, other strong communities of native, uh, of indigenous, they will say, um, you know, the, the, the name of the tribe. But so, but that's happenstance. There's no like collected resource that, you know, to go to, to, to tell you that. That's why studying the context of, um, of the place where your ancestors were born, like you say, if it was in Saltillo, say, okay, I'm gonna see a little more about what was Saltillo like in that year that my ancestor was there. You read a little bit of the history, you can find abbreviated ones online or get books, however far you wanna go. Or you could Google you know, indigenous and Saltillo or whatever you're looking for. And, um, and try to say, okay, well, maybe it was possible, you know, if you have an inkling that that person was an indigenous person. So you have to do a lot of extra legwork. There's no one resource that's gonna kind of lay it all out for you, unfortunately. Not yet, anyways. <laughs> Not yet, that's right. Yes, and then the last question we will finish off with today is based on family stories, and this is from a community member who they think their maternal grandmother was sent as a child on a train from Mexico to San Antonio to flee the Mexican revolution. Wow. I'm interested in finding his birth records in Mexico. Do we know of records being destroyed or less reliable during that time? Um, so yeah, it could be an issue, but not always necessarily. If you have the name um, and you know, you know, it's between the late, you know, 1890s and 1910 and like that, you know, cause that Mexican revolution kind of spanned, you know, a series of years. Um, if you know the name and you know the parent's name, then, you know, go there and try and find those people uh, in all of the, you know, review the presentation and find all the, you know, ways that you can start looking for things. Uh, and so that would be uh, in, you know, civil registration. And then if you know the last name, I don't know if you've searched, as I said, there are border crossing uh, records um, available uh, on family search, also on ancestry, but I'm, I'm leading people toward family search because it's the easiest, it's free, you know, just easy to go there. Um, and, uh, and plug in a last name and that you can check off type of record and you can click immigration and then see your results there. So you can always filter your results if it's gonna help your you know, search. 
And uh, so once you start exploring the database, you'll see what I'm talking about. You do actually have to get in there and play with it. Um, so, or if you know that your, um, the child who crossed was maybe accompanied by somebody, maybe you don't know that, but if you could possibly put those names together, um, sometimes they do say, you know, on those border, uh, on the Laredo, um, you know, passage records and El Paso, those are the two main places where people crossed. Um, they'll say, you know, accompanied by child. Sometimes they give the name, sometimes they give the year or, you know, young, or sometimes they'll just say young. I mean, it's very inconsistent, you know, the filling out of these forms that constitute our, our records. But, um, but you start looking in that way. Uh, or if you know, you know, more years, you can actually go in and just cruise all the browse through the, the records, you know, click, click or arrow, arrow, next, next. But, um, you know, the more parameters you can start with, try using your search skills and parameters first and the clues that I just mentioned. And then if you can't get anywhere, then you're kind of reconciled to one of those browsing things, which takes even more time. But um, so that's how I would start that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Donna, for <laughs> answering um, all those questions. And there's uh, probably a few more and they'll keep coming. So yeah. and Donna did uh, on her in her slide, she included her email address. Yeah. Um, I'll make sure to include it in the chat as well. But if okay. you have any more questions, you know, reach out to her. She'll get to the emails when she'll yeah. get yeah, and again, it might be a while. Sometimes I just, and sometimes the questions that are asked via email, I found, are not just easy to answer. Like why I just had, you know, I, how I've said several times in answering these questions, I need to know more about the whole record. What does it look like? Where is it from? What year is it from? You know, to sort of make a, a reasonable suggestion. So the more information you can provide, the more, the better answer you will get. So... Um, and again, it may, may be a while before I get back to you, but you're, you're certainly welcome to ask me. What and once again, you? congratulations to Natalie. I'm so very happy for your milestone, Natalie. Thank you, Donna. And thank you everyone for the congratulations. <laughs> you surprised me for sure. Good, we should celebrate that. Yes, we will. Um, I know, and hopefully anyone who, um, let me turn on my little camera. Um, yeah, soon, hopefully we can come together again soon and, and safely. And if you need help getting connected to uh, the vaccine, um, reach out to us. We can offer information on locations and help. You know, right now they're pretty much giving it to folks without registering. Um, so, but if you need any help or, or information, contact us. And yes, and, and also, sorry, I want to say, if you can make any kind of small donation to this uh, initiative and to all the programming that we do, and we're going to do more later, more to come, um, you know, I think there's a link on the Facebook Esperanza page, and uh, maybe you could put, a, did you put a link already in the, in the comments and chat? Okay, good. Yeah, even as $5, whatever, you know, um, it's all, it all helps. Yes, thank you for yes. saying that, Donna. Sure. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. And we're just gonna play this um this little end. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, you can tell I'm I'm really passionate about genealogy. <laughs> I think it's really worth doing. Yes, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And I know you mentioned like looking through all of those documents and all those photos might not be fun to some people, but. Oh yeah, well, you have to be the right type of person. Yeah, it's not for everybody. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you all again for joining us and um, be in touch. And we're gonna be having um, programming in honor of our annual Paseo por el Wasai throughout the month of May. So we'll um, start promoting and getting those dates out to you soon, but just um, stay tuned and stay safe and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you all. Bye everyone.